All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. So today we have MTS Khan from the Recon Center, who is a team leader for the, for the approximate Bayesian inference team at Recon. And today he'll talk about the Bayesian learning rule for adaptive AI. All right. Should I start? Yeah. And if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask during the talk. Floor is all yours. All right. Thanks a lot for, for inviting me and thanks a lot for coming here to, to listen to me. Uh, so yeah, I'll just kind of talk about some of the recent things that we have done uh, on the Bayesian learning rule for adaptive AI. So the slides for this talk, they're online. Uh, you can find it on my website. Um, and you can also see a poster that we have made for our recent last two years research that you can find many uh, things there. Okay, so let me start with um, the goal. Um, the main thing that we are interested in for the last uh, 10 years or so um, uh, is the designing uh, design of AI that learns as quickly as humans and animals. So basically, uh, trying to make machines that can quickly adapt to new situations that arise in the future, uh, but yet uh, preserve the old knowledge robustly um, and, and reuse it for the future. So um, as you all probably uh, know and realize that humans are extremely good at this kind of learning, I usually motivate uh, by showing this video of my daughter, uh, she's kind of trying to uh, collect experiences about the world and in the beginning she doesn't really know what is relevant, what is irrelevant, uh, what is good uh, information, what is bad information, and then eventually she kind of figures out that maybe it's something that is relevant to her uh, just like after six months of learning. And now she she's kind of producing that experience uh, from the world. Uh, um, and if you give her more time, then she will kind of use her past knowledge to get again and again, you, uh, you know, relive the experience that she has liked. Um, and, and this is the amazing quality of human beings that they can sort of adapt and transfer the past knowledge. Now, when we uh, think about this, this type of things for machines, unfortunately, machines are not really good in this kind of adaptation. So, so sometimes they, they are kind of too quick to adapt to new information, so they fail because of that. So this is an example of this uh, uh, chat bot, uh, tweet bot uh, called Tay Tweets by Microsoft AI in 2016 that kind of was deployed in the morning and by the evening it's kind of overlearned the racist kind of comments from people and then started saying very bad things to, to other people and it has to be shut down after that. So it adapted too quickly to the new information and forgot the old stuff. But the opposite is also true, like in robotics, for example, the system's usually very rigid. And if you change, you know, make a slight change in the environment, the robot cannot like very quickly adjust to it. So, so machines have this problem that they, they're, they cannot sort of um, uh, easily adapt to, uh, you know, old and new knowledge. So today I want to talk about this adaptive and robust learning where by using some kind of Bayesian principle, and the thing that I want to talk about is that this kind of learning uh, that we humans and other animals do, it must kind of trade some old and new information. And it has to have some kind of uh, balance between, you know, uh, where to pay more attention. Should I think about what I know from before or should I pay attention to the new knowledge? And, and my hypothesis here is that this kind of good algorithm that know how to balance this information uh, they are sort of have uh, a Bayesian nature to them. So they are inherently Bayesian. And that's the hypothesis that I want to communicate. So um, I will talk about the first work, which kind of builds the foundation of all of this is a learning rule, uh, this Bayesian learning rule that's, uh, that will be the Bayesian um, algorithm that will build everything on. And I'll talk about how robustness sort of emerges from this rule. Uh, with a concept that we call memorable experience. It's kind of a dual um, you know, representation of the posterior approximation that we compute using Bayesian learning rule. And then from there, we'll go into adaptation to see how all of this kind of comes together 
to allow us to do some adaptation task. Um, in the end, the, the summary of the talk is that it's a new perspective of base uh, eventually that helps us to do this kind of adaptive and robust things that can be applied to modern machine learning, uh, you know, um, um, uh, fields like deep learning. So that's the ultimate goal. So I probably don't have that much time. Uh, so I might have to skip something and I hope I get to touch upon all of this uh, uh, to an extent that it makes sense to you. Uh, but if not, uh, some of these papers, uh, no, uh, you can look at them. Um, only one is not out yet, but the rest are there. So I hope that you can at least get the relevant references so that you can read them later on. All right, so let's start with the main motivation. So uh, this Bayesian learning rule that uh, we proposed in, in, in our paper recently, um, we kind of started with this kind of question of what is, uh, you know, what are some common principles of good algorithms? Uh, so the question is kind of similar to this origin of species that talks, you know, asks this question about uh, all the living organisms that exist in the world. Uh, what are their common origins? And here we are kind of thinking about what are common origins of algorithms that work well in practice. And one thing that sort of um, comes to mind is that a good algorithm, as I motivated you before, a good algorithm must be able to uh, kind of make this trade-off between new and old information. So it should revise its past belief by using uh, and identifying useful uh, future information. So trying to understand what's new and what's already known uh, is a trade-off that an algorithm must make. Um, and this is kind of true for you know, natural or artificial algorithms. Uh, here we're going to talk about only artificial algorithms. So the hypothesis then is that the origin is, uh, is Bayesian, uh, meaning that good algorithms must uh, optimize an objective um, that looks more Bayesian, which is on the right. Uh, the usual non-Bayesian objective is what we are used in deep learning, for example. So you have just a loss and a parameter uh, for the model in neural network, and then you just minimize that kind of empirical risk minimization or uh, maximum likelihood principle. Uh, but we are arguing for a different objective, which is shown in the right. And this objective is, it's, it's, a, it's actually a Bayesian objective. Uh, you, it's, it's equal to sort of uh, looking to Bayes rule and you may not see it right away, but that's fine. Um, maybe this will become clear uh, soon. So basically what we're doing here that we are not optimizing just the loss and finding one model parameter. Rather, we are trying to optimize the expected loss with respect to a distribution. And we are trying to find that distribution. So you can just think of this distribution as like Gaussian approximation, Gaussian distribution, or you could think of it as a posterior distribution, the exact one according to some probabilistic uh, model. Uh, so we are trying to find that kind of distribution and we are finding it by solving. So we wanna minimize the loss, but we want to minimize it on average. So if you sample multiple models from this distribution, so maybe multiple neural network, uh, and then you look at their losses, they should all be kind of be small. Uh, but then we have this entropy here and we're regularizing the entropy of the distribution, meaning that we want the, the samples from the distribution to be diverse. So we want, don't want the uh, samples to collapse um, onto a delta distribution. So it's kind of a fundamentally Bayesian objective. Um, and it's, it's very different from this non-Bayesian one. Uh, and then the, the, um, the, uh, the, and the, the learning rule that we propose is basically saying that most of good algorithms, they should optimize something like this using this algorithm that I have written here. And this is uh, what we call Bayesian learning rule. What you are essentially doing here is that you are optimizing the parameter of the distribution. So lambda is the natural parameter of an exponential family. So let's just assume exponential family for now. Uh, and lambda is the natural parameter. And we are updating it using some kind of gradient style update. Uh, the different thing here is uh, compared to other algorithm is that we are taking the gradient with respect to 
a different parameterization, which is an expectation parameter. So you don't need to kind of, uh, you know, really know what natural and expectation parameters are, but just think of like, you know, uh, they are like, think of a Gaussian, think of like mean and covariance, and then mean and covariance are transformed into some natural parameterization. And there's an alternate parameterization, which is like mean and correlation. And you're taking the gradient with respect to mean and correlation, and you're updating the natural parameter uh, using that. Okay, so not gonna go too much into detail of this, but you could check out these two papers. This is originally proposed in 2017. And then uh, recently we wrote this to show that many uh, you know, algorithms can be derived from, from this kind of update. The math is all kind of, may look complicated, but that's not the important point here. The important thing uh, that I would like you to take away from this slide is that the um, the old belief uh, that the the uh, algorithm has it's it's uh, somehow encoded in this natural parameter, and the new information that's coming in. Uh, is coming through this kind of gradient that's taken with respect to expectation parameter. It turns out it's a type of natural gradient. So it has a, a close connection to information geometry. And we're not gonna go into the detail of that, but, the, uh, but this is kind of uh, the construction that's absolutely necessary if you want to derive many uh, you know, types of algorithm from a single rule is what we are uh, trying to show. So it's okay if you don't kind of follow the math, but just remember that there's a natural gradient here. There's some kind of exponential family posterior approximation. And now you can kind of choose the posterior approximation and you can do some approximation to, you know, how you compute the natural gradient. Depending on these two things, you will get different algorithms. So- Sorry, this, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. So in, in the Bayesian learning rule, the entropy term does not show up or there's no term that relates to entropy? Or... Great, thanks for that question. Actually, it's, um, I did a little bit of cheating. So I, I wrote um, it in a form where it's um, for minimal exponential family. So actually for minimal exponential family, the natural gradient of entropy is lambda. So this term actually corresponds to entropy. Okay, okay, that makes sense. So, so you see that you get this kind of like moving average where you, you know, the two things are at the same level, like you take convex sum of the two. So that's why you can call this as innovation. This is a new information that comes in and this is old belief. If it's gradient descent style, you cannot say the same thing because they're not really sitting in the, you know, uh, so entropy plays a very important role in doing this kind of exploration. That makes sense, thanks. Great, Great. so in the paper, we have, a, um, we have a you know, bunch of learning algorithms that we derive. Uh, and essentially there are two choices to a posterior approximation and natural gradient approximation. So you could change the posterior approximation to different things and you get kind of different algorithm. And you can also um, uh, change the approximation to the natural gradient and we'll get to what kind of approximation we're talking about. So, and, and with these two choices, you can derive many things. So just gonna illustrate the simplest algorithm, so gradient descent with this construction, just to give you a sense of how this actually works. Um, and uh, essentially uh, what happens Actually, just give me a second. It's very distracting that I keep getting notification for people joining and then my mouse doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to stop that. It, it's, it's okay. I, um, yeah, if I'm not co-host, maybe that, then I don't see the notification, but, uh, but it's okay. I don't want to break anything right now. Okay. To be better now. Uh, Okay, great. <laughs> so, so let's go through the first simplest algorithm, so gradient descent, we all know <clears throat> how it works. So you compute the gradient, update the parameter. And the <coughs> hypothesis here is that you can derive this by choosing a Gaussian approximation where the covariance is fixed. So it's a very, very simple distribution. So let's say this is the distribution <clears throat> and the mean is unknown and the covariance is fixed to identity. 
uh, it could be other uh, matrices as well. So we'll, we'll change it soon, but uh, let's just assume this to be I. <clears throat> One for now. And in this case, the natural parameter is just the mean and the expectation parameter <coughs> uh, is just expectation of theta is also the mean. So they're both mean. And the entropy of a Gaussian of this kind where the covariance is fixed, the entropy is constant. So this is a very, very simple one. You write the Bayesian learning rule. Sorry, it's now it's written with entropy here. Uh, sorry about that. But um, you essentially just plug these things in. So M is here and this is M. So M is here and M is here. So you just take the gradient with respect to the same quantity. And because this is constant, it just goes away. So you just get the gradient of the expectation, right? So you could see that it's just almost looks the same, uh, makes sense. And here now you have an expectation while in this non-Bayesian algorithm, you don't have it, right? So this is where the natural gradient approximation comes in. So if you really want to recover a Bayesian, um, non-Bayesian method from a Bayesian method, then you have to kind of get rid of the expectation. You have to get rid of this Bayesian averaging. So we'll do that. We'll, instead of looking into the full distribution, we're going to approximate it at the mean. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and this is known as delta method. That's very popular in statistics. Um, and with this kind of, you can see that Bayesian learning rule is essentially the same as gradient descent. Right? Now, when I do this, many people, you know, I've been asked, getting lots of questions for many, many years, like, why do you do this? And this is this, this seems like cheating. You did some, you know, yeah, I really want this non-Bayesian method from a Bayesian method. But, uh, you know, Bayesian method, in inherently within law always involves some kind of averaging because it's Bayesian uh, and non-Bayesian methods will not do that. It'll be more kind of greedy and it'll make a decision at one point rather than sampling around from the distribution. And I want to now, now in the next few minutes want to convince you why doing the Bayesian one is slightly better than doing this. It turns out that uh, SGD might be doing something similar to this rather than uh, doing something like gradient descent. So um, let's try to get into that. So what we're going to do uh, in the next, like maybe 10 minutes or so, we're trying to make variants of this thing. So we did this delta method. We try, try to remove delta method and we'll see that we'll get some kind of variational or Bayesian methods that will be, uh, that'll have kind of similar property to SGD, but will also give us uncertainty estimate. So my really, the main uh, thing that I want to communicate, uh, which I really want the community to do is to put the expectation back in. Let's be Bayesian. Let's not do uh, you know, something like gradient descent, but let's do something more like stochastic gradient descent perhaps. So uh, that's where I'm headed. So let me try to first motivate you why this expectation is important, okay? so. You see that in this all, uh, ob uh, objective, there's no expectation while we have expectation here. Um, I, I can demonstrate this with a very simple example by Ferenc actually and from his blog, it's taken. Um, and you know, you can think of like, let's say that your loss is actually just kind of this kind of non-convex problem where you have multiple local minimum. And what you can do is you can try to use a Gaussian uh, and look at the expectation of this loss. Yeah, so the expectation will be a function of the mean and the variance, right? So there's two quantities. And I can now plot the, this loss, the expected loss, with respect to mean and the variance. So what actually happens here is that as I increase the variance, uh, you could see that the minimum, the local minimum, the spurious ones, they sort of start to disappear. So you're doing some kind of smoothing uh, when you compute the expectation. It's like a Gaussian smoothing that you're doing and maybe more dominant minimum are kind of remaining. This concept now is kind of a little bit more popular that instead of optimizing original loss, let's optimize a different loss, it's a smooth loss. And it has become very popular recently in deep learning, for example, where we call it implicit regularization. Uh, but actually, this kind of idea has been very common uh, for, for many, many years uh, in reinforcement learning, learning, in search community, like simulated annealing and other kind of like perturbation uh, methods in optimization. 
So essentially what is happening when you're taking this kind of expectation, you are getting rid of some kind of uh, weird places and maybe, maybe it's making your journey a little bit smoother to go through. So why should this be good is the question that you may ask. And I want to give you a very simple example to show that bays have this kind of flat minima, flatter minima property that it somehow tries to go to flatter places because of this moving. It intuitively makes sense, but I want to make this a little bit more concrete of why exactly this happens. So in gradient descent, if you look at the solution of the gradient descent, basically the gradient is zero, right? So it's just one point and the gradient is zero. But if you look at the solution of Bayesian learning rule in the same fashion, actually you will re you realize that it now it's it's not just the gradient at one point that's zero. Now it's the gradient of the expected loss with respect to the mean of the distribution is zero, right? Uh, now this may look very different from that, but you can do a trick. It's called Bonnet's theorem. It's in the paper, you can see the equation 25. Essentially what's going on is that you could push this gradient inside the expectation. So now the gradient is not with respect to the argument of the distribution, rather it's with respect to the loss, so this parameter p. So now these two things look a little bit more similar. I know that this looks like a magic trick, but just believe me that this is true and it will make your life easier. So the two things now look very similar here, we are computing the gradient at one point, but rather here, we're computing gradients at the samples from Q star, so the optimal Q that I got by optimizing uh, using Bayesian learning rule. And then I want these gradients to somehow cancel out and become zero. So it's kind of trying to find a circle where all the gradients point you know, towards uh, each other and they cancel each other out. Now, this kind of noise that's been injected uh, in, in the Bayesian uh, solution, because you're sampling with the distribution, it has a similar regularization effect to the noise that's being put in stochastic gradient descent. And that's uh, a claim that I'm making. And I won't be able to prove it uh, theoretically, but I will give you an intuition of why this is true. So uh, ultimately, the Bayesian solution actually also prefers flatter direction because of this property of the solution. So let's kind of go into a very simple toy example to get an intuition about this. And the example that I'm going to use is this kind of asymmetric loss. So the, the loss, one side is flatter, this side is flatter direction, and that slide is very steep. Okay, so we don't want to go to that side because it's a very bad place, right? Suddenly you hit the wall, but the flatter direction is preferred. So the good solution should actually go that way, right? So it should have this kind of very, very um, you know, if you're safer, you can think of it as like standing next to the cliff. And of course, when you're sort of standing right at the edge, you're very dizzy uh, by construction of your brain. And it's like that here that you don't want to sit like right next to the cliff, but you want to be safer, you know, uh, away from the cliff to a place where things are a little bit more robust. So um, actually it turns out that if you run SGD on this kind of problem, and uh, you can believe me that this is the same problem, but it looks more flat here. So because of the scale, but it is this kind of problem, the minimum is actually here. And if you run SGD with a step size very small, then it kind of converges to the map estimate. So this is fine. Uh, but as you increase the noise, you, the injection in the noise, it kind of goes away from the wall. So now it's kind of going to the other direction. And this Gaussian that I'm plotting here is basically, it's like a burn-in style. So I picked some red dots samples and I just computed mean and covariance with those samples and just trying to show that the iterates are moving in the opposite direction. If you increase the step side even more, it'll, then the extent to which it jumps towards the flatter direction, it becomes more. And makes sense because the gradients in the other side are really large. So they push you very heavily to the other side, right? The same thing happens when you increase the step size even more. So this is kind of the summary that as you increase the step size, you go to that direction. It's the flatter side. So it makes sense. Uh, and people have done this thing. And it turns out that you could get the same effect using the Bayesian solution. So let's do this as GD where we fix the variance. So in the derivation, I fix the variance to one, but let's change that variance now. So if I want my distribution to be very broad, it should somehow be avoiding that side. 
is that's the, the principal buffer, okay? So that's what happens when you fix the variance. So here variance is fixed to one, your solution sort of goes away because it has the zero avoiding property. So it's trying to avoid that area where there is a huge loss, okay? This actually makes sense if you look into the math of it. And I will encourage you to read the figure one of the paper where this is all explained. Essentially, um, you have to, sorry, my daughter is calling me. You have the uh, distribution and it needs to be sort of in the other direction because uh, you, the gradient on this side is much larger than the gradient on that side. So you need to assign lower weight. So the distribution needs to assign higher weight here. So it moves in the other direction. I'm sorry, I cannot do anything. I'm gonna talk. Okay, her iPad is not working. Um, too much adaptation has happened there. Um, okay, so please have a look at the paper and read that. So my claim is basically is that you can get the same kind of implicit regularization that you get by choosing learning rates. And sorry for the poor graphics here, but essentially these dots, they're being obtained by different learning rate from SGD. So these are SGD solutions. But the blue one is obtained by increasing the variance. So in the simple example, you can choose a Gaussian where you increase the variance. And as you increase the variance, the solution goes arbitrarily far. And it's always convergent on like GD. So the noise kind of is very, you know, you can inject more noise and you will be in more flatter places. Makes sense. So I hope it actually makes sense and um, spend 25 minutes on this. So I hope it was worth it. And so I will repeat the claim that I, with, with the help of my friend, Bernie Sanders, and this is my first meme. I've never used a meme in my talk before. So <laughs> I apologize if it's uh, not funny, but um, Bernie here is asking you to be Bayesian one more time. So be, by being Bayesian, what Bernie is saying is that you should put the expectation back in. So, you know, we, we want, we don't want to uh, use point estimates we want to do expectations of the loss. We want to do some kind of ensemble that is computed using a distribution such that the distribution samples are diverse, right? So many times when people kind of think about these things, they forget this, uh, that they, you could do an ensemble, but if ensembles are not diverse enough, then Bernie won't be happy, you know? So you should have this entropy term always there and the entropy term should help you to diversify things. Uh, you shouldn't just be kind of doing hacky things if you're uh, a good Bayesian. So we're working towards that. And that's where these kind of methods have come. You know, we've worked on this for, for many years now. Um, we've written a couple of papers and three of them I have uh, put here. Um, and they, they are getting better and better uh, every year. So it's, it's uh, we're very happy about that. So 18, 19, and 20. And then now uh, recently at this uh, New Rips 2021 challenge, we applied the third one, uh, which is the or most advanced version that looks much more similar to RMS prop and Adam. So it requires kind of like making some of, relaxing some of these approximations. This is the advantage of seeing everything through the Bayesian lens is that now that you know that these are kind of using this Delta method, you can always go there and remove the Delta method and then you will get a Bayesian method out of it. Right? So that is the uh, thing that we have worked on for, for many years to come up with different strategies, which makes it easier to use this intuition that most of these algorithms are doing something Bayesian with approximations. And if you relax the approximations, then things will become better. So it's not just changing the posterior approximation, but it's also changing the gradient approximation of how, what kind of innovation, what kind of new information you're mining through these gradients, you can change it by relaxing some of the assumptions that are made by these hacky deep learning methods that work extremely well, well in practice. So hopefully we can use some of those magic here uh, and reduce the magic part and do things more principled way. So it was quite uh, amazing for us that we used this, uh, the third uh, method here and it really worked out of the box. So it was very, very easy to implement. So there will be a paper about this where they will summarize what they did, and hopefully you can read about uh, about that in the in the paper. So I encourage you to watch the one of the member of the group that won this challenge, Thomas Mullenhoff. He gave a talk, uh, and uh, you can go and have a, have a look at how the solution that they used in this. Okay, 
So I have used almost 30 minutes. That's good. So I'll go next five minutes very quickly on, um, on how we got to these methods. So I only explained to you SGD. Now I'm gonna to try to explain how like RMS prop and Adam like algorithms can be obtained. Um, basically they're kind of Newton variant where the covariance is not fixed. So now you're learning the size of the covariance so that you can find a good flat minima, for example. Uh, so you can adjust the, the, the variance and that's what these, these methods are, are doing. So um, the amazing thing about Bayesian learning rule is that it's also kind of have this idea of complexity. So if I increase the quality of the approximation, if I go from a simpler approximation to more refined one, then I will get a better learning algorithm out of it. So it's very satisfying to actually see that the theory really, really works. You know, uh, it never fails here. So the, the toy way of seeing this is that if you had a very simple approximation, like the one that we used in SGD, uh, sorry, in, uh, gradient descent, um, you just use the mean and we move the circle. I mean, don't change the width, um, the size of the circle because the covariance is fixed, then you get the gradient descent. But what if like I now allow both the mean and the covariance to change? So I use something like um, an ellipse now. And now I want to fix the, also want to estimate the covariance. It's a more complex posterior approximation because it has now two degrees of freedom, mean and covariance. Uh, then um, uh, obviously we go from first order method to a second order method. So it's actually very beautiful. Uh, the natural gradients kind of just reduce themselves to give you uh, gradient and the Hessian instead of just getting gradients in the gradient descent. Uh, you could kind of take this thing and you can expand it. So you can use mixture of, of uh, Gaussian and you'll get an ensemble method. And this ensemble method uh, is something that, that uh, you know, challenge that the one was actually used, this mixture of uh, um, Newton method where we are essentially making sure that different mixture components take responsibility of different regions. So the entropy term is really trying to push away, repulse these uh, you know, Gaussian components to take responsibility of different regions. So, um, so, so it, it works reasonably well. It hasn't got to a place where we really want to go, but there's something that we are working on now. And, and, and the amazing thing is that if you continue doing this and you just plug in the exact posterior in Bayesian learning rule, then Bayesian learning rule becomes Bayes rule, uh, which is what you, you would uh, hope. So it's all kind of works and going from simple to complex, um, you get more complex algorithms. So the, 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 the derivation is very, very straightforward and I'm not gonna go into it. Like if you wanna derive Newton method, then just choose a Gaussian with mean and a covariance and then write the natural parameters, write the expectation parameters, and just kind of do the, you know, turn the crank, write down the Bayesian learning rule, sorry, yeah, write that other form that I showed you. So the entropy is the lambda and then put it there and then kind of just plug these things in. Uh, so plug the natural parameters, write the expectation parameters, and then uh, invoke some identity. So there are some theorems that helps us to push these gradients inside, like the Bonnet theorem that I showed you before. So you can push these gradients inside. So you can write this in terms of the gradient and the Hessian. And, and you just uh, apply this thing. You, you, you get something like this. You, you, know, you do some things and then you get Newton's magic. Um, so I, I would encourage you to read the paper and, and see these details there. It's kind of hard to get all of these things at once. Um, but um, what is, uh, what is amazing now is that with this kind of thing, there's also this other robustness property about, about this flatter minima. So you, you, know, you, you, you have a Gaussian and now you can adjust the covariance of it. And so you can avoid this kind of sharp minima and go to the flat minima. Okay. So I'm not gonna go too much into detail of this, but essentially we took this Newton method and made some adjustment to it. So bring it down to like use diagonal covariance to something like Adam. So it's kind of a second order method, but then it looks like very much like Adam. So you just have to change a few lines of code. And now like unlike Adam, it just gives you one line. So like one decision boundary, like blue. Now with this algorithm that we called Wogan uh, in our earlier paper, you can get samples uh, from a Gaussian. And it works extremely well on ImageNet. 
So this one, this resulted in an ImageNet. And when this was done, this was like one of the first algorithm that sort of worked well in ImageNet. Um, the math is actually again quite nice because you 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 get you know you get this kind of gradient you compute and you sample from a Gaussian, so you perturb the weights. So it's kind of injecting noise. It's the same principle here. So this is the Bayesian part because you're sampling from a Gaussian and you're perturbing your gradient, so you're smoothing your loss somehow. Uh, but then the computation of the variance goes through the scale, the scale that is used in RMS prop. So it's very pretty that the update of the scale is very similar to what you have in update, uh, what you have in our RMS prop. It's just that instead of using square of the gradient, you use some kind of second order estimate. So you do Hessian or you do this Gauss Newton. And now in the new paper, we actually don't even have to, we can just use the gradient. So we do some kind of reparameterization trick to estimate the Hessian. And then it's, it becomes much, much simpler just like that. So that's the um, thing that actually won the challenge. This was this third paper, which is an improvement over this algorithm. So you can uh, have a look at that. So I'm going to skip the details here, but um, you know, you can check out the papers and visualization. You can look into my NeurIPS tutorial uh, if you want more details on this where I, I so this is slightly old stuff, but um, hopefully it's in the new uh, perspective in the last two years, what we have done, I hope it, uh, it seems a little bit more appealing than what it used to be. Okay. So now I am hoping that I'll take, so I've used 35 minutes according to my clock, uh, but although we have used 40 you know, minutes in real time, but the next uh, 10 minutes or so I spend on adaptation and robustness and talk about new stuff that we have done now based on Bayesian learning rule. Okay. So I'll be very quick here again, but um, I'm happy to discuss with you later or like, you know, even do a Zoom meeting if some of the people are interested in knowing more details about these things. Uh, I'll be very fast and I hope it still makes sense to you. So, okay, so let's first talk about robustness. And um, as I said at the beginning of the talk, I mean, we show that all of these algorithms can be derived using Bayesian learning rule, but what do we actually learn in the end? Like, can we actually learn something about how we can use these algorithms to do adaptation, right? So now we are looking into that, how the Bayesian learning rule can actually give you that aspect. And the main insight lies in this, uh, this idea that good algorithm should be able to tell apart relevant versus irrelevant information. So it's like my daughter who can kind of figure out that the, the music that comes from the fretboard is the relevant things and everything else is irrelevant. So we want some of this kind of property. Um, and when we think about like, how can we tell something is relevant or something is irrelevant, then uh, we actually go into this very fundamental way of knowing this thing that if something is new, if something's already known, and if I remove that knowledge or if I perturb that knowledge, um, sorry, if, if, sorry, what I wanna say is that if something that is known and is important, if it's important past knowledge, and I perturb it with new information, um, then, you know, if the new information is not new, then nothing should change. You know? So the system shouldn't move much. So it's this kind of idea of perturb the things and then measure the sensitivity to understand if something is important, something is relevant or irrelevant, right? This idea, even though kind of, um, you know, uh, we say perturbation and sensitivity, this idea has been known uh, in many, many fields for a very long time. And the term that is used is duality. It's a sort of looking into a dual representation, some kind of Lagrange multipliers that helps us understand the sensitivity of different parts of the model. Okay, and this is very abstract that I'm saying here. Um, just make it a little bit more formal in this next slide of how this manifests itself in vision learning rule that you can think about the loss now made up of many parts and the parts in a simple like deep learning um, style thing is uh, data examples. So you have many data examples and maybe even a regularizer uh, here that makes the model uh, your loss function. And these are parts, so if you apply Bayesian learning rule to them, you essentially just get some of these innovations. So these new information that's coming from each data point is kind of summed in 
if you use a batch method, right? Uh, so now actually you can sort of use these new information to compare which data example is more important, which uh, example is more relevant than the other. So just like my, my daughter is able to figure these things out, uh, a train model should also be able to tell a part of the important information. So actually it turns out that if you look at the solution, you can of course tell, uh, say this because the fixed point of this is lambda star is equal to the sum of these natural radians that are computed on individual uh, data examples. So I'm just kind of writing the fixed point of this where this row somehow cancels, right? So lambda equals lambda, you get this equation. And now you have left-hand side, you have this global parameter. So it's the distribution. And the right-hand side, you have individual local information for each data point. And so I'm gonna call this as a local sort of natural parameter. It's not really correct term to use, but I'm gonna call it local natural parameter, lambda tilde, and tilde and denotes the localness of it. So it's computed for each data example, and then it's summed. And now because it's summed in the same sort of space, you can sort of tell which one will contribute more. And this is the intuition. Uh, so the one that have larger values will contribute more. And this will be uh, already good, but it, the story is even better. So it turns out that these natural gradients are actually Lagrange multiplier. So they're actually dual variable. So they're actually measuring, they're telling you what would happen if you remove this data example, or if you perturb this data example, what would happen to the solution? How much the solution will move? And this is really a million dollar insight that I think everybody's kind of angry at me when I say Lagrange multiplier, why do you make these things so more complicated? Why do I have to learn about duality and all this? But really I can't shake the fundamental idea out of the equation. It is there and it's, it's, it's in front of us. So we have to deal with this. We have to learn about this and that's what I've been doing. So the past two, three years we have spent on this and now we know quite a lot more about this and we can be very confident about this, why this is an important fact that this quantity is Lagrange multiplier. Something that I wrote in 2013, 2012 is when I did this work and it showed up uh, many years later, it doesn't leave me. So we wrote this paper for GP recently uh, where some of the math is written down. So I will encourage you to check this. And this really connects back to old work in, uh, in 70s and then also in late 90s was done, with lots by, done by lots of Bayesians that have somehow forgotten about duality. So it's kind of sad and I'm trying to bring it back, okay? So I'm not gonna go into detail of memorable experiences, but we have kind of tried to figure out which data examples are what type, and if they're important or not, if they're easy, they're uncertain, they're outliers. And you can do this by looking into these variables, okay? And I will skip this part. Um, but essentially just show you the result in the end, maybe I can tell you later if you, somebody asked, is that if you look into these lambda i's, you can kind of tell like easy examples that are correctly classified, but outliers that are mislabeled like this five, which is a three, but it's actually five or nine. So it, you can tell them apart. And these are kind of extracted using these kind of sensitivity uh, lambda tilde Lagrange multipliers, okay? And you can tell uncertain variables that are sort of sitting right next to the decision boundary uh, because they are very weird ones. You know? So this always kind of works. I'm not gonna go into FMNIST, but we have applied it to now lots of deep learning benchmarks. And we are writing a paper on this, uh, which hopefully will be out soon. So this is still kind of uh, in preparation. It's a large paper, it's been wor in working for two years. The, the important point here is that it's the same story that I told in the Bayesian learning rule. You change posterior approximation, you can get criteria to identify different types of example naturally out of it. So different moments of the posterior distribution gives me a different degree of freedom to understand what kind of perturbation these examples are responsible for. What kind of knowledge do they hold? Are they uncertain examples? Are they difficult to classify examples? Are they easy examples? All of these things, they naturally emerge. I don't have to design, uh, you know, go there and say, I'm going to take a hinge loss and compute support vectors and they will be some kind of dual variable. Or I'm going to compute an influence function by measuring uh, artificial kind of perturbation. The perturbation naturally arises because the posterior distribution knows the right information. 
this is super beautiful. And so wait for this paper to come out. Hopefully it'll be out. It takes us more time. I want to do this right. So I'm not, uh, we're not pushing this uh, too early. We're not in the race of pushing, you know, doing the first one to do this, uh, but rather do this in the right way. So this is quite nice because all these local parameters are free. They, you can apply this to any ML problem. It's computed from gradient and Hessian or some reparameterized gradient. And it works generally for anything, any kind of loss function. So this success has kind of led to, okay, I've used 44, so I'm kind of late now. Um, uh, so this has led yeah, to- I mean, it's fine. Don't worry about the time we can, okay. we can continue. <laughs> Five more minutes and then I'll, I want to leave, I want to have some discussion with questions because it's otherwise boring to just me talking about so many things. Okay, good. So. This has led to base duality. So this is a new kind of concept of duality to understand dual representation that come out, come out of Bayesian posterior. And we are very lucky now that we have many researchers uh, working on this. So we've got a, a lot of money. We're very uh, fortunate. Um, the project started last year in October. We have a Twitter account. So lots of these things would be displayed there. So please join uh, there. And if you're interested in, in collaborating with us, on this project, uh, very happy to have more collaborator. We will be holding like uh, annual events to have you know physical events, maybe in Japan or France somewhere, uh, where we will be happy to have more people who are interested in uh, understanding and applying or um, working with us on base duality and lifelong learning. Okay, with that, just let me finish things on adaptation. Of course, I've taken too long. But there is like, um, yeah, these, this is all published work, so it should be fine. So I'll go very quickly on how all of these things can be used to forget, to avoid the forgetting of the past. This is a big field of continual learning. And of course, the word memorable example is used with that, with that idea that memorable example is somehow trying to remember what is important in the past. So if you can kind of identify that important information, you could try to freeze it and you could try to contrast it with the new information that comes in. And if the new information is bombarded at you uh, and you should really forget the old information, some of these memorable examples will disappear. So that is the kind of idea and what we do. So we have two, uh, we have two papers. Well, the second paper is the one that is doing continuous learning where we take you know, a classifier we find some memorable example. Well, which type of memorable example is kind of a key point, which is not yet clear how to define that. But basically we're gonna use this dual representation to define some sort of memorable example. And if we make the right choice, then we will not make, uh, we will not forget things. So it all depends on like what kind of assumptions you make. And we show some, uh, you know, earlier results in this paper where things kind of work out. So it's, it's actually not a very difficult idea if you're familiar with continuous learning, then you will already kind of see, based, essentially you have this weight regularizer that you usually put in, uh, you know, this was in the original Kirkpatrick as um, uh, EWC paper. Uh, we basically show that you can replace this by the dual and the dual of a quadratic, uh, uh, you know, in the weight space is a GP in, in the function space. It's a very nice result that we have forgotten now, uh, <laughs> which was known in the old times because SVM and, GP were kind of together in all times. So uh, it's actually just kind of writing the dual and uh, then weighing the dual appropriately using some kind of, uh, so if you write down the math, everything kind of works out. You, you get these dual variables that go inside and these are also like dual variables that are compared. So there are two kinds of dual variable. So one is for the mean one and the other is for the covariance. And they do two different things. One kind of makes sure that the predictions match. The other one, one makes sure that they, the, the weighing is there. So the variance is sort of appropriately just assigned to different things. It's very, it's really amazing. And I didn't think that in my lifetime, I will be able to see so many amazing things coming out of a single rule that, uh, that you know, been working on for some time. So uh, really like this is all, with Bayesian learning rule. I don't know if you could see this and duality is not really used in the papers because it was before we were using the term duality, but it's all kind of, uh, if you look into this first paper, this Gaussian process expression is derived using Bayesian learning rule. And it's the first dual paper that we wrote actually in the recent time, but the word duality is not used there. So you don't see the connection. So we worked a little bit more on 
formalizing this form of the functions that we get. Um, and it turns out that it has connections to, uh, to you know, defining prior. So these are not really using Gaussian process idea, but trying to define a more general concept in the function space. So combining function space and weight space both. Uh, and these are these priors that makes the be best of the both worlds. We call them K priors. And it turns out that they are kind of reconstructing the gradient of the past. So they're really keeping some relevant information from the past. Maybe it's the gradient, maybe it's the Hessian, depending on you know, what kind of approximation you choose. You can have like you know, one order of information, two orders of information uh, using the posterior approximations of different kinds. So it's, um, uh, yeah, so I would not show this, but essentially it shows that if you increase the number of memorable experiences, then the gradients sort of become you know, more and more accurate. So these are the gradients and you're approaching the true thing as you include all of the data in the limit. Okay, so I'm done. So to summarize, I present a new perspective of Bayes that I believe uh, is essential for adaptive and robust deep learning. So doing this kind of adaptive AI. And the main point of this perspective is that the choice of posterior approximation is crucial. So, so you know, even if you don't want to use some of these methods, the point here is not to use particular method, but to show that by choosing right approximation, by choosing right kind of natural gradients approximation, you can trade off different kind of information, what to keep, what to pass, what to transfer. You know, these kind of things are all kind of built in through uh, one Bayesian rule, which we call Bayesian learning rule. Uh, and now we are kind of working on using these kind of ideas to do knowledge representation and knowledge transfer and knowledge collection uh, to make an AI that learns like, uh, like us. Okay, so. Um, here's the team, and many of these people have also contributed to the talk that I've shown here. Um, so, yeah, I'm done. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. It was extremely interesting.